Let's start with a little bit of prayer, shall we? We've already begun, but just to uh, refocus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Good morning. morning. We're heading into uh, Theology of Mission Part 2 this morning. The Kerygma. First thing we want to do in talking about the Kerygma is start at the beginning. And the beginning is to define what do we mean? What are we talking about? Kerygma, of course, is a Greek word, and it literally means the preaching. So it was the preaching of the early church. We can break it down, however, a little more and sort of uh, unpack that and see exactly what, what are we talking about. The proclamation of the basic good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we mean by kerygma. The proclamation of the basic good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, his saving actions, and the coming of the kingdom of God, which invites the hearers to conversion and eternal salvation. So that pulls together all the various elements of what we mean when we say kerygma. It is, as Peter Herbeck would say, the germ cell. It's the uh, the energy source, the absolute core of the Christian faith. This is the core, the real heart of what it means to be a Christian, the preaching of this basic good news of Jesus. So what we want to do is we want to take that definition and break it down a little bit. Let's look at each of the parts so that we can understand it more deeply. So the first aspect, of course, is Jesus Christ. The first aspect of the kerygma, the content of the kerygma, is Jesus himself. Our proclamation is about a person. It's about a person, Jesus of Nazareth. Once again, we quoted yesterday Pope Paul VI, there is no true evangelization if the name, the teaching, the life, the promises, the kingdom, and the mystery of Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, are not proclaimed. The Holy Father John Paul II confirms this in one of his encyclicals. The church's fundamental function in every age and particularly in ours, is to direct man's gaze, to point the awareness and experience of the whole of humanity toward the mystery of Christ. It just can't be stressed enough, the centrality of the person. The proclamation is about a person. One of the great obstacles to the evangelizing mission of the church in our day and age, and in our culture specifically, is when you say evangelization, people immediately think of something else. Probably what they think of more than anything is colonialization. So we went somewhere and we imposed our values, we imposed our system of belief, we imposed our whatever on these peoples and it ruined their culture and it ruined their... That's sort of what the media is saying today. You know, were there errors made in the colonial times? Of course there were. Of course there were. And the church has many times repented for that. Okay, But when we're talking about the kerygma, we have to help people see we're not talking about colonialization. We're talking about a person. We're talking about Jesus himself. Are you with me? Amen? Amen. All right. But we're also talking about the work of Jesus, his work of salvation, right? So the second aspect of uh, the content of the kerygma under Jesus is his death and resurrection. He was, as St. Paul says in Romans, put to death for our trespasses and raised for our justification. This is the heart of the work of Jesus, put to death for our trespasses, raised for our justification. In 1 Corinthians, St. Paul basically tells us what is at the heart of our faith? What is it all about? And then he gives us these words, For I delivered to you as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, 
He was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as one untimely born, he also appeared to me. The very heart of the message about Jesus, that he died and that he rose again, and he accomplished the work of God. In Acts 4, St. Peter also, we see that he's, con- he's saying the same thing in another way. This Jesus whom you crucified, God raised him from the dead. And he's the source of the power that you now see at work. A crippled man had been healed. You want to know how, why this happened, how this happened? It's because Jesus died and rose again. And there is no other name under heaven among men by which we must be saved. So the proclamation is about Jesus and it's about his saving work in his death and resurrection. This leads to another component, sort of a crown of that, and that is that Jesus is Lord. In Acts 5, but Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than man. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers subject to him, he is Lord. Now, to really grasp just how revolutionary this is, we need to sort of take a step back and look at a bit of salvation history. How many young men here ever played King of the Hill? Right? Okay, some women too. All right, King of the Hill which means that there's a hill in some park somewhere and some young guy gets up there and I'm king of the hill. And then one at a time, all these other young men trying to come up and move him off of the hill. And they're wrestling and there's bodies throwing all over the place. It's a lot of fun and it usually involves a hospital visit at some point or another. (laughs) But at the end of the day, the strongest kids at the end going, I'm king of the hill, I've won. Well, to a certain degree, there is a very serious King of the Hill struggle going on in salvation history. Through the fall, death became King of the Hill. Sin and death rule in the world through the fall. But God was not content to leave it that way. We have in Genesis, right at the very beginning of God's revelation to us, Genesis 3.15, a revelation of something that is to come. We call it the Proto-Evangelium. It's it's telling us in advance the gospel, the first proclamation of the gospel. Because the Lord turns to the enemy and says, okay, you've won this day, but there's going to be a return match. There's going to be another to challenge as king of the hill and is going to take you off of that hill. So we have a promise. The, The woman and her seed, whom we know is Jesus, fulfills that, is going to meet Satan and his seed, which is eternal death. So it's almost announced, a bit like a WWF tag team match extravaganza, you know. This isn't over yet. This is not over. This is not over. And of course, this is what happens. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will strike at your head and you will strike at his heel. He will crush your head. He will destroy your kingdom and you will reach out to wound him. Okay? Through the wounding of Jesus in the passion, the enemy is overthrown, and we have a new king of the hill. Jesus becomes Lord. He comes to reign. He is the rightful king who has reestablished his place as king of the world. Amen? Amen. The church is at the front line battle. The church is the front line battle of this struggle about who is Lord and who is King. Now, the Holy Father has very prophetically been warning us for a long time that if Jesus is not enthroned as King, if he does not have that place in our society, in our lives, if he comes off of that hill, who then takes its place? Death, once again. We end up with a culture of death. So who becomes the final solution to all our problems? It's not Jesus anymore. It becomes death. Who has the final word in all our problems in society? 
If it's not Jesus, it will be death. And we see this lived out very dramatically in our own day. You have an unwanted pregnancy, what's the answer? Death. Kill it. You have wombs that have the power to bear life, but they're an inconvenience to my pleasure. What happens? Kill it. I no longer can deal with the stresses and the struggles of my life. Possibly suicide is an answer, or to kill the pain through drugs, alcohol. See, death becomes a solution to the problems instead of Jesus being the solution to the problems. When we proclaim Jesus as Lord, we're saying he's the answer to everything. He has the ultimate answer. He has the final word. He is the solution to everything, to every problem, and to every need. Amen? Amen. Cardinal Ratzinger points out very dramatically as well what is happening. What is happening in our time? What's at the heart of the spiritual struggle for our society and our culture? He says the central problem of our time, the central problem of our time is the emptying out of the historical figure of Jesus. It begins with denying his virgin birth. Then the resurrection becomes a merely spiritual event. Then Christ's awareness of being the Son of God is denied, leaving him only the words of a rabbi. Then the Eucharist falls and becomes just a farewell dinner. You can see the struggle going on. Because if Jesus is reduced to just some mere man, then has he overcome death? Has he become the Lord of all creation, the king of the hill? He is Lord. He is God incarnate. He is the one who triumphed over Satan and death through his death and resurrection. He did know who he was and what he was about. And he has accomplished these great things. So we need to understand what we mean by Jesus is Lord. All right. So to just summarize that, the content of the kerygma, the first aspect is Jesus. Is Jesus. The proclamation is about a person. It is about his saving work, his death and resurrection, which leads to the crowning of that, which we're saying is Jesus is Lord. The second element of the kerygma is the kingdom of God. Jesus reveals the kingdom. Jesus gradually reveals the characteristics and the demands of the kingdom through his words, his actions, and his own person. He is revealing the kingdom of God. It is central to his preaching. If we look carefully at our Lord's own preaching, we find that his declaration that the kingdom of God has come is core, it is central. The kingdom of God is at hand. Therefore, repent and believe in the good news. When he sends the 72 out, what does he tell them? Proclaim, the kingdom of God is near. So it's very central to his own message. What do we mean by the kingdom of God? What are we talking about? Well, Cardinal Ratzinger gives us the key to unlocking it. The key word of the proclamation of Jesus is the kingdom of God. But the kingdom of God is not a thing, a social or political structure, a utopia. The kingdom of God is God. The kingdom of God means God exists. God is alive. God is present and acts in the world in our life, in my life. God has dominion. He is alive. He is moving. He is acting. This is what we mean when we're proclaiming the kingdom of God. He has come among us and is establishing his reign. Who is this kingdom of God for? The kingdom of God is meant for all humankind. And all people are called to become members of it. We touched on that briefly already. And who is the king? Jesus is the king. He was the prophet of the kingdom in his earthly ministry. Through his death... His resurrection, we've already seen, he becomes Lord. He shares the Father's dominion and power. He is king. He is the king himself. John Paul II reinforces this. The kingdom of God is not a concept, a doctrine, or a program subject to free interpretation. We can't make up what we think the kingdom of God is. But it is before all else a person with the face and the name of Jesus of Nazareth, 
the image of the invisible God. Now, we've already touched on this, but we need to understand that salvation history is a clash of kingdoms. It's a clash between two kingdoms. The Father rescued us from the power of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of His beloved Son. Through Him we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creatures, which means another way of saying He is Lord. Then comes the end, St. Paul tells us, when He, Jesus, will hand over the kingdom of God uh, the, over the kingdom to his God and Father, when he has destroyed every sovereignty and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. So we see St. Paul unraveling the mystery, unraveling the mystery. This struggle for lordship is going on in our midst. The kingdom of God has invaded the kingdom of this world. He is coming with his mercy, his grace, his liberation, his redemption, his power. And Jesus is the king, taking the kingdom for himself. He is bringing the kingdom of God and winning all to himself so that every person can transfer from the kingdom of darkness through the fall into the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. All right. The church is the beginning, the seed of that kingdom on earth. It's like the beachhead which our Lord has established and which is intended to grow and to move, to spread, to permeate all society, all culture, and every heart to transform creation into the new creation. The third aspect of the kerygma is conversion. Jesus began his public ministry with the call to conversion. We all know this. And the call to conversion remains at the essence of the preaching of the whole early church and the church through the ages. So what do we mean by conversion? Conversion is turning away from evil and turning to God. Turning our back on one way of life and turning towards God. It's what we do in our baptismal promises, right? Especially every Easter when we renew our baptismal promises. What do we say? I renounce Satan and all his empty promises. I renounce the glamour of sin. I renounce all of these things. And I turn towards God. And I profess my faith in him, in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. A turning away from sin and a turning to God. There's an absolutely beautiful passage in the Catechism of the Catholic Church explaining what we mean by conversion. And it's worth, it's worth reading. It's a little longer quote but it really grasps the heart of what we're talking about. It's from number 1432. The human heart is heavy and hardened. God must give man a new heart. Conversion is first of all a work of the grace of God who makes our hearts return to him. Restore us to thyself, O Lord, that we may be restored. God gives us the strength to begin anew. It is in discovering the greatness of God's love that our heart is shaken by the horror and weight of sin and begins to fear offending God by sin and being separated from Him. The human heart is converted by looking upon Him whom our sins have pierced. Let us fix our eyes on Christ's blood and understand how precious it is to His Father. For poured out for our salvation, it is brought to the whole world the grace of repentance. Oh, there's so much packed in that and we could take a long time to un unfold it. But through the grace of God, through God's gift, we begin to see the horror of sin. We begin to see its ugliness, its evilness. We begin to see how, how it is distorted and wounded and hurt. But then we also begin to see the grace and the power and the love of God who gave his own son who allowed that he be crucified so that we could be set free. So this conversion is not so much the fear of hell, but the love of God, which shows us the truth about who we are and about who God is and what he's accomplished. Amen? Amen. Okay. Cardinal Ratzinger builds upon this again. The Greek word of converting means to rethink, to re-question one's own life and common way of living. 
to allow God to enter into the criteria of one's life, to not merely judge according to the current opinions. Thereby, to convert means not to live as all the others live, not to do what all do, not to feel justified in dubious, ambiguous, evil actions just because others do the same, to begin to see one's life through the eyes of God. Here's the core, right? By the grace of God, we begin to see our life through the eyes of God. Thereby looking for the good, even if uncomfortable. Not aiming at the judgment of the majority of men, but on the justice of God. In other words, to look for a new style of life, a new life, turning towards God. Now we all know that God has made us free. He gives us to be made in his image means we have the power to choose. So his invitation calls for our response. He invites a response from us. He appeals to our freedom. He reaches out to us and asks us to say yes. Can one reject Christ and everything that he has brought about in the history of humankind? Of course he can, says John Paul II. Man is free. He can say no to God. It is possible. But this is what we mean by conversion. God, through his grace, softening the heart of his people through the proclamation of his love and calling them back to himself, inviting them to say yes explicitly. The final aspect or the final uh, content of the kerygma is eternal life. What are we speaking about? In making man free, it means that we are responsible. God has made us responsible, and we will be judged. Cardinal Ratzinger tells us, a last central element of every true evangelization is eternal life. Man will be judged. He must account for things. If we seriously consider the judgment and our responsibility, then we will be able to understand redemption. The fact that Jesus in the cross takes our sins. God himself in the passion of the Son becomes the advocate for us sinners. What is Cardinal Ratzinger telling us? And this is very key. When we're proclaiming the judgment, we're proclaiming eternal life, what he's saying is we can't begin to understand the gift of redemption until we've understood the consequences of sin. When we see when we see the effects of sin and where it will lead, when we see the reality of judgment, of having to account for our own lives before God, we begin to understand that by strict justice, none of us can be saved. That we have sinned, we have fallen short, and we deserve in strict justice to be lost. If we understand that, if we grasp that, then we begin to really appreciate with honest gratitude, the incredible gift of God to us in Jesus, who has taken away our sins, united us to himself, has done what we could not do, has saved us despite our being unworthy. We begin to really understand the eternal realities of what we're all about. Amen? Amen. Okay. The promise of God. When we speak about eternal life, we're speaking about God's promises being unveiled. It's not doom and gloom. God has made us promises. If we follow him, if we say yes to him, we respond to his invitation. He makes us promises. St. Paul says it beautifully in 1 Thessalonians. For the Lord himself with a word of command, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, will come down from heaven. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus, we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, console one another with these words. Now that's pretty radical. He's saying, this awesome event is going to happen. The day will come when the Lord will return. And it will be a great and awesome day. The dead will rise, will be caught up in the air to meet the Lord. A powerful, awesome event. 
but as people who belong to the Lord. Should that be a day of fear and trembling and hiding under the rocks? No. He's saying, console one another with these words. The Lord's coming back. There's going to be a judgment. Console one another with these words. You see, when we've really grasped what it means to have been won by God in Christ, to really grasp what it means that Jesus is Lord, when we've really grasped that, then love eclipses the fear. We receive the love. The love envelops our life, pierces us, permeates us. We're not afraid anymore. We don't live in fear of death. We're free from the old king of the hill. We're freed from him totally. And we live under the lordship, the dominion of Christ and of his love and of his ultimate victory. Amen? Amen. All right. If the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then the one who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. All right. So a little review. Look up from your pages. The four elements of the kerygma, what were they? What was the first element of the kerygma? Jesus Christ. What was the second element of the kerygma? The kingdom of God. The third element of the kerygma? Conversion. I saw somebody looking at their sheets there. (laughs) The fourth was eternal life. So together, let's say them. Number one, Jesus Christ. Number two, the kingdom of God. Number three, conversion. And number four, eternal life. All right. The kerygma of the apostles. We want to turn now for a moment and look at this reality in action. We want to see the early church living out this reality. The Acts of the Apostles records six summaries of the missionary discourses which were addressed to the Jews during the church's infancy. And we have them listed there in your notes. Six, if you will, uh, episodes of the church preaching the kerygma in the earliest uh, part of its life. These are model speeches, the Holy Father tells us, delivered by Peter and Paul, Proclaim Jesus and invite those listening to be converted. That is to accept Jesus in faith and to let themselves be transformed by him in the spirit. So we want to look at the Pentecost discourse, the preaching of the gospel. I guess we could say for the first time after the church has been born, right? Jesus himself was the prophet of the kingdom. But now having received the Holy Spirit, Through the mouth of Peter, the church is proclaiming the kerygma for the first time. Now, you have a handout of Acts 22, Acts 2, verses 22 through 39. As we've already seen yesterday, Jesus, in his ascension, tells the church, wait for the promise of the Father. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The church goes to prayer, and God delivers, right? The Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes and they are empowered by the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And then Peter stands and delivers the charismatic message. Okay, so the death and resurrection, Jesus Christ. Where do you see Jesus Christ proclaimed? Just put up your hand and and call them out and and, uh, we can start to begin to isolate them. Where do we see the proclamation of Jesus? Jesus appears in the first line of his, I mean, what's he preaching? He's preaching Jesus, Jesus the Nazarene. Right away. Okay, that's one spot. Another spot? Ah, yes, Father. This man, delivered up by the set plan and foreknowledge of God, you killed using lawless men to crucify him, but God raised him up. Right there in the second sentence of Peter's preaching is the saving work of Jesus, his death and his resurrection. God raised this Jesus. And yes, resurrection of the Messiah. Does anybody see the lordship, the ascension of Jesus? being proclaimed in that passage? Where's that? What what line is that? Right. God raised this Jesus. Of this we're all witnesses. And we see the ascension there very clearly in his lordship, exalted at the right hand of God. And then we see his pouring forth of the Holy Spirit in his place of lordship. Okay, let's move along because we're we're short on time. Let's have a look at the kingdom of God. Who can show me where the kingdom of God is? Okay. Okay. Um, Well, essentially, they can mean the same thing. Different ways of saying the same reality. He's at the right hand of the Father, and he's boss. He's king of the hill, you know. 
Uh, a king, kingdom, kingship is just explaining that a little more further because who's a king? king has subjects. He's the one to whom we owe our, our, our loyalty and our love, and he's the one, we belong to his kingdom. It's another way of saying it. Okay. So the kingdom of God. Yes. So the king who is David, this is somebody who's over top. Even David, the great king of Israel, he's the king. When you talk about king to Israel, you think David. But this guy's higher than David. So kingship is there as well. Okay, conversion. Any place we can see conversion, the, the proclamation, the call to conversion. We're heading to this side of the room now. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Can anybody see as well that there's a call for a response? There's, there's a need for a free response there? What are we to do, my brothers? What are we to do? There's a need for a response. Okay, here's the tough one now. Eternal life. This is, this is a little tricky. Who can see that one? Yes. Yes. That applies to Jesus, but it also applies to all who are in Jesus, right? He will not abandon our souls to the netherworld. And, you know, see, that's the core of our own resurrection. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises made to you and to your children. What promise? Eternal life, okay. And also, one of the things that I didn't make explicit when I was talking about this was St. Paul talks about this gift, this reception of the Holy Spirit as a foretaste and a promise of, of eternal life, of the beatific vision, about being with God forever. So it's all there. And then, of course, we see, as we talked about yesterday, the Holy Spirit backs the preaching of the gospel. He confirms this through the signs and wonders which follow on the day of Pentecost, right? The miracle of hearing. People from all over the world heard, you know, the, the gospel being proclaimed in their own languages. Um, so the Holy Spirit does back the preaching of the gospel. He brings the word to life. He brings the power and authority of heaven to stand behind the message. God acts when the word is spoken. So basically, then we can say this is the heart of of the message. This is the beating heart, the germ cell, the power source of our proclamation, the kerygma, and those elements in the kerygma. This is something that, as Catholics, we need to know, needs to be second nature. We need to understand it, be able to dig into it a little bit, like we have done in this talk, to be convinced of it personally, and to proclaim it. And of course, we're going to take this theory today that we've just learned and we're going to begin to learn how to apply it as the day goes on. So, praise God. There we go. All right.